Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Our presenter is just having a few uh, technical issues, so we'll be uh, starting in another minute or so. Good morning, everyone. We're just uh, talking to our presenter. She's having some technical issues, uh, so she's not uh, not with us right now. But uh, uh, we do have uh, our MP, Adam Vancouver, in here on standby. Hi, Adam. Hi. Hi. Good morning, Scott. I'm like an aircraft air traffic controller. Nice to see you, Scott. And uh, I'm sorry I can't see anybody else, but I'm sure everybody is out there, and I hope you're doing well. 
Um, it's wonderful to join you on this Friday morning. I'm up in Ottawa at uh, my Hill office. Have um, some parliamentary duties to do this week. And if there's time, then I'd love to talk about the uh, the fall economic statement a little bit and some of the the um, the more relevant uh, investments that are proposed uh, that have um, an anti-racism lens. Sure. I mean, Adam, if you wanted to, while we're waiting for Kara, you could. Uh... I mean, we'll uh, we'll have a more formal introduction of you uh, during the webinar. But if you wanted to uh, just start talking about some of the uh, the things from the fall economic statement, sure, I'd love to. So um, on Monday, the first ever female finance minister presented a fall economic statement, which was um, which was really really incredible because honestly, it just illustrates how prepared. This country is and how prepared this government is to um to ensure that we build back better and you know that that three word sentence has been used by countries around the world but it's a plan it represents a plan to um recognize that this is a global thing pan the, the, the pandemic has been a global um challenge that everybody has faced but it has certainly impacted groups some groups particularly bipoc and women um far more disproportionately and far worse. Um, it's identified holes in the system and cracks in the system uh, and those need repairing because they, uh, those vulnerabilities are just uh, simply not okay. Um, so parts of the, uh, the Build Back Better plan um, that was announced um, are geared towards fighting systemic racism and discrimination and, uh, and ensuring that racialized Canadians and indigenous peoples across the country um, have a, have a fair chance uh, because it's very very obvious that uh, the current system is not built for them and it's not uh, creating enough opportunity for racialized Canadians. Um, and the reason that I say this is because it's evident that racialized Canadians have experienced many of the worst health and economic impacts of the pandemic. Um, so there are um, about 12 programs that uh, that were proposed. And the first and the biggest one is the Black Entrepreneurship Program uh, that was announced on September 9th, actually. And that's an investment of up to $221 million, including up to $93 million from the government of Canada over the next four years to launch Canada's first ever Black Entrepreneurship Program. This is gonna help ensure equitable access to support opportunities for Black business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, its intention is to help thousands of business owners, Black business owners and entrepreneurs recover from this crisis and grow the, the business. Um, other provo proposed investments um, include launching a pilot program to open bidding opportunities for those businesses and building off the success of the procurement strategy for Aboriginal businesses, which was quite effective. Um, we've also included $33 million over the next three years uh, to support the 50-30 challenge in collaboration with diversity seeking groups and business stakeholders. Um, 60, uh, sorry, $6.6 .6 million to support a task force on modernizing the Employment Equity Act and another 3.6 million on an ongoing basis to expand the workplace opportunities and barriers to equity program. Um, and that's to promote projects that help federally, federally regulated workplaces become more representative of, of Canada's diversity because so many, like so many boards, like so many, um, you know, banks and, and larger operations, um, they're just not representative of what Canada looks like. Uh, there's been there's $12 million here for three years towards uh, a dedicated center for diversity in the federal public service at the Treasury Board Secretariat, um, which will accelerate and increase the government's uh, um, efforts to uh, to increase and achieve that representative public service that we all know is important. Um, a $50 million commitment over two years to expand Canadian heritage community support, multiculturalism and anti-racism initiatives. That's the CS Mari program. Um, that's in, in my uh, line of work here because I'm the Parliamentary Secretary for Diversity, Inclusion and Youth. So I work very closely with the CS Mari program as well as the ARAP program. And the ARAP program is the Anti-Racism Action Program. And what these two do is they're basically, they leapfrog each other in terms of um, when the uh, the application deadlines come up. So if you aren't successful in getting the ARAP program, then you can apply to the CS Mari program and, and so on. And if you're not successful, then they provide um, really good insight as to exactly why and how you can become um, successful next time. Um, but they provide lots of equity seeking organizations, equity seeking groups and community serving organizations across the country who are doing programming and education 
and research uh, and lots of other things um, to support all sorts of community multiculturalism and anti-racism initiatives. And uh, it's been a pleasure to be a part of that program. Um, there's just three more. Sorry if I'm going a little over time here, Scott. It's nice. There's a long list of, uh, of efforts. Um, there's $13 million over five years and $2.6 million ongoing to protect communities at risk of hate-motivated crimes, um, providing not-for-profit organizations such as places of worship, schools, and community centers with funding to enhance that security infrastructure. Uh, there's $6.6 .6 million over five years and $1.6 million ongoing to support the implementation of impact of race and culture assessments. And then finally, there's $28.6 million over five years to support the Community Justice Center's pilot projects. So these, uh, um, there's, there's a whole bunch more for youth, but that's a lot of numbers. Basically, what I want to try to illustrate is that um, the, the Black Parliamentary Caucus, of which I'm a member, uh, convened in June and wrote a paper with five very clear mandate directives. And those are all represented in these, in, in these numbers here and in these initiatives and pilot projects. So it's a, it's a pleasure to, um, to be doing my best to represent various communities across the country. It's a pleasure to be on the Parliamentary Black Caucus. I've learned so much. Um, we hosted a couple of anti-racism webinars and as well, we had a round table during Black History Month and, uh, and I've reached out to other equity seeking groups and other racialized communities as well for insight and perspective. And I want you to know that that insight and perspective that I've gained through those interventions has led to change, has led to government making this a priority and it's a priority for me and it's a priority for my youth uh, council here in Milton who I met with yesterday. Their top three items are diversity, inclusion and anti-racism, uh, climate change and truth and reconciliation. They're an incredible group of young people, 38 young people in, in Milton, um, mostly racialized young women who are like powerful. Like I get so much out of the, these meetings. So if you have any questions about these or other programs then I'm here for you at all times, not just during this webinar, uh, I'm easy to get a hold of. And uh, when I'm back in Milton, I'd love to, we'll probably do a Zoom because we're not doing too many in-person meetings these days. But I wanna wish absolutely everybody the best on this call. I don't know um, if I'll be back because we have a, a webinar to, to all take in and enjoy, uh, but I wanna wish you all the very best for a happy holiday season. And uh, please stay healthy, stay distant. It's gonna be a tough holiday, probably visiting with a lot of family members that we're used to seeing uh, in person, uh, typically we're gonna be doing it on the screens this year but uh, we can celebrate distantly and, and stay healthy and, and happy and safe. So uh, whatever you're celebrating, whether it's Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, or something else, happy holidays. And uh, it's really nice to, to be here with your, you today. Thank you to Scott and the Chamber for convening this very important webinar. Thanks, Adam. And uh, for everyone, we're, uh, we're still having technical issues with, uh, with Kara. So uh, Melissa from the Chamber staff is on the phone right now with her trying to, to resolve it. So. Uh, in the meantime, Adam, you mentioned the 50-30 the challenge. I'm not sure a lot of people understand what that's all about. So maybe could you expand on that? Yes, I can. Sorry, I was just trying to copy the... Uh, you caught me off guard because I was trying to copy the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the initiatives that I mentioned. I've got them on two screens here. Uh, so the 50-30 challenge is uh, is otherwise known as the diversity advantage. So you can go on the website. Why don't I just post this link? Um, because it's all about, it's a framework to accelerate diversity. Uh, it's already taking place. Um, you can have a look right here. Apologies, guys, I'm a bit clumsy. I don't have a mouse. Yeah, there it is, it's showing. So if you can click, you can click on it in the chat if you'd like. Um, but I can just go through it a little bit. I'll read the, the about section. Um, so this is an initiative between the government of Canada, uh, businesses and various diversity organizations across the country to, um, to um, it strive to increase corporate diversity. Uh, this, is, this is one of the most important uh, issues um, that uh, organizations, companies and institutions need to look like the communities that they endeavor to serve. Uh, the government is shaping a plan to improve access for racialized persons, uh, people who identify as LGBTQ2S, people living with disabilities, as well as First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, uh, to, push, to positions of influence and leadership on corporate boards and in senior management. So um, the, the goal of the program is to challenge Canadian corporations to increase the representation uh, and include more diverse groups within their workplace, while highlighting the benefits of all Canadians, giving them a seat at the table. The government uh, has always believed in seeking the best available advice 
and the 5030 challenge will be developed uh, with the help of decades of expertise with uh, from advocacy partners and uh, with a variety of tools. So it's um, there's lots of information on the website. As I read, I'm learning more and more about it. Um, there's um, a message from the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry here, who's uh, he's Navdeep Baines, and he's an amazing minister, and he's our neighbor to the east a little bit. Um, and the partners there are are, are quite broad, uh, and that includes um, the Aboriginal Chamber of Commerce, and I believe the Black Chamber of Commerce as well. Um, so it's a it's a challenge, and it's an initiative. And now that I've posted the um, that's just the 5030 challenge. I'm going to find the building back better budget proposal from the FEZ. FEZ is how we call the fall economic statement. Um, and it's a huge document, but I've just gone ahead and found like the anti racism initiatives. And um, yeah, Adam, what we can do too is uh, we can get all the, uh, the links to the things that you were talking about and we can share those uh, with everyone that, uh, that registered for the webinar. Yeah, perfect. Uh, I can provide these resources in another document too. It doesn't just have to be an email. But um, I'm happy to to spread the word a little bit. I'm happy to uh, to be on my toes here too, uh, Scott. If you'd like, I can continue to talk a little bit about um, this. Is the nature of Zoom is that it allows us to come together, but then when it, you know, it won't. I was having a little bit of a glitch. This is my third Zoom meeting today, and I was having a bit of a glitch with my first one. So I understand uh, what Kara must be going through. Yeah, so I'm not sure if you, uh, you've seen some of the questions coming in the chat box. If not, I can just read them to you, but- uh, Please. So the first one uh, from Kevin, um, may I suggest we build in a mechanism to ensure that we have communication channels set up at the community level right across the country to keep this conversation going, which creates awareness and informs action for both community and government. That's a, 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 that's a really, really good recommendation. And if I might be so bold, I think that um, I think that these types of opportunities are just that, and my my office endeavors to do just that. So, Kevin, if you have recommendations on specific dates that you'd like to meet, perhaps in January, um, I have every intention of doing some Black History Month programming around the Black Entrepreneurship Fund. And, uh, and some more educational seminars and webinars and things like that. Um, but my office is here. The main thing that I think that, a, that an MP does is bring people together. And Scott, I mean, it does that as well with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I suppose that's the main difference between my job and Scott's job is Scott's job is to bring people and businesses together and people to businesses uh, for economic development. And my job is just a bit broader, but certainly my job is to bring people together. So Kevin, if you... Um, I think that mechanism, that federal mechanism, is meetings with your MP. And I've tried to be uh, the most available MP over the past year. I've really tried my very best to respond to as many emails as I can in person, be at all the community events that's possible. Obviously, in 2020, that's been a bit of a bust because, you know, um, but as Scott will tell you, the, 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 one of the best community events that we had all summer was the, was the, uh, the farmer's market, and we tried to go as often as we could. Um, but I think that's a great idea and a great suggestion. And if we can be doing a better job, and when I say we, I think I mean Scott and the MP's office, all ears. Yeah, you've touched on this a little bit, but uh, the next question talks about uh, how municipalities can start a serious, uh, or can have, start serious work on this topic with the help of people like you, um, and, and presumably with, uh, with Mayor Krantz and the, the town staff as well. Absolutely. And actually, Milton has already gotten uh, started. I wish uh, that Samir or Mike could uh, could elaborate a little bit. Um, yeah, we can actually, uh, I can let them talk if you want. If they would like to, um, I would be Googling, um, you know, Mil the town of Milton's diversity and inclusion plan and because they have an action plan and it's actually really, really great. So um, if I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I just got put on the spot. So it's only fair that we all got put on the spot today to talk about our wonderful government initiatives. So if either Councillor Ali or Councillor Cluett would like to talk about the various municipal diversity and inclusion anti-racism initiatives. And I mean, I, I will say that over the past year, um, I've seen a marked difference in both the mayor's enthusiasm and willingness to celebrate all sorts of different cultural events. And that's what the CS Mari program is all about, right? Is convening opportunities for people to celebrate and to to celebrate diversity and our community in Milton is one of the most diverse in Canada so absolutely important that we continue to celebrate okay I'm gonna I'm gonna speak for a little bit um, 
And uh, this is Councillor Ali. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak on this very important topic about diversity and inclusion. Um, I happen to be the first woman of color on Milton's Council. And so one of the first things that staff and the mayor under the mayor's leadership did was as you know when when I was elected is that we we started our um, we started re reviewing our official plan and so we're going through the Milton official plan review and we did a lot of workshops and a lot of um, survey exercises and um, the topic of diversity and inclusion kept coming up and every time they would say, okay, so we need to find out how, you know, as Milton changes, how we change our direction, how we pivot in a way that we are more inclusive and we are, you know, um, how we operate is, is how our community looks like. And so both, both things match. And so um, myself and all of my colleagues, we were really, um, keen on getting the diversity and inclusion file included. And so during one of those exercises, when we were finalizing all of the things, like Adam pointed out, it's part now of our plan is that diversity and kept pushing for it. And then it got included in there. And so now, as Adam rightfully pointed out, our direction has pivoted in a way where we are more more diverse, more inclusive, but it's it's a journey and we have just started. So we have a long way to go. And uh, I am very happy that, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who support this initiative and the community appreciates it a lot. And slowly but surely you will start seeing more things that are being done to be more inclusive, be more open and be more reflective of how our community looks like now and how it's going to look like in the future as well. So, I mean, that is the update I have from my side on this. And if Mike is in this meeting, I can't see anybody. So if he's in this meeting, um, I'm sure that he will, he will add more valuable input to this discussion. It looks like Mike is there. Yes, I am. Thanks very much uh, for, for the opportunity. And I agree uh, totally with what Samira was saying. Uh, it's a step-by-step -step process and We've taken that first step as a council to have the conversation with Milton residents and, and our, uh, the other groups uh, that are part of Milton. It's not something that uh, government can sort of wave their hand and, and come up with a policy that everybody's going to like. We're going to have to have a conversation. And we started that. We've started our, we had a culture uh, discussion online uh, on Facebook just the other day some great uh, discussions, some great uh, topics uh, were being brought up. And it's going to be a learning process for a lot of people uh, throughout the community. And uh, some things aren't going to be perfect, and we're just going to have to keep working on it. And, and uh, that's why I commend Adam for having the, this uh, type of discussion here today. It's got to be something that's going to be part of the process, our official plan process. Uh, the town is working on its uh, diversity and inclusion uh, uh, plan. And uh, there's going to be uh, some announcements coming in the new year. And again, more discussions uh, with Milton residents, with the groups, with uh, all levels of government uh, to make Milton, uh, we, we call it the place of possibility. And it's got to be a place of possibility for everybody. And everybody's got to have an equal opportunity uh, to take part in that possibility. So really excited about the next uh, 20, 30 years for Milton. And uh, we're going to have these discussions more and more. And again, Adam, thanks for uh, hosting this. Thanks for having us. And uh, looking forward to the uh, rest of the discussion this morning. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, and thanks, Adam. Uh, there's another question that's come in. Uh, uh, Adam, I'll direct this to you. But Samira and, and Mike, if you want to chime in, that's, that's great, too. But uh, uh, talking about uh, the amazing work and all these initiatives uh, for youth in the community and and perhaps the communications of those initiatives through the high schools. Uh, the schools are looking for projects and fundraising ideas to motivate change and education within the community of Milton. Well, the youth of Milton are very alive to the various issues affecting uh, Canada and the world. It's, um, it's no surprise, in fact, that uh, youth aged uh, 12 to 18 are sort of the most 
uh, woke, if you can, if you if you don't mind me saying that, but it's it's uh, a word that's just used to describe people who are aware of what's going on in the community and aware in the world, and uh, and it's certainly true that they are. Um, I met with my youth council just last night, um, just very briefly, as they were electing chairs for their various um, sub caucuses, as we're calling them. So they have like a like a climate change sub caucus and an anti racism diversity and inclusion sub caucus, and I think two or three others. Uh, I'm not sure how the elections went, but I'm sure now there's some leadership installed. So we're looking forward uh, to hearing more from them. Um, there's also the Milton Youth Task Force, which perhaps Samira can talk to a little bit more uh, about. But youth always have their own ideas. And if it's a fundraiser, then I'd be happy to help. Um, you know, promote it on social media or to try to get a little bit more interest. Uh, I've done a school visit every two weeks or so with a, di a different class, uh, most obviously virtual class for the last uh, month or so. Um, if you're a teacher or if you think if you have a relationship with a teacher that you um, think would like to have a chat with the MP, they're really fun. They're usually very informal. The kids have awesome questions. Um, but you, the youth are really, really active in our community. We had like seven, seven or eighth graders organize uh, the anti-racism um, parade march in um, parade makes a, it puts a better spin, a more positive spin on it than protest, but it was a protest um, in, uh, in, I think it was in June and it was very well done. And uh, I, I'm, I'd be very comfortable just handing the keys to the, to the country over to youth, uh, you know, in many respects. Um, I think they do an incredible job being organized. And if there's anything that I can do as the MP to promote their good work, um, then, I, then I would love to do that. I think that question was from Nicola. And if you have uh, suggestions, Nicola, uh, you know where to find me. And uh, we've, uh, we've got Kara with us now. Uh, uh, she's on her phone, so we don't have video, but uh, Kara, I think uh, you can hear us. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, we've been- I must uh, apologize. No, that's okay. Uh, we've been getting Adam to tap dance while uh, while we're waiting. <laughs> I appreciate it. Now, uh, I know you have a presentation, and uh, so you we have your uh, your audio, and I think uh, Alyssa is going to be able to uh, to share your uh, your uh, presentation when it's time. Okay, that sounds great. So, um, whenever you're ready, um, Alyssa, just let me know, and I'll I'll do mine from my end. While we're getting prepared too for uh, for everyone's uh, sake, I'll just uh, give a little bit of a background. Kara uh, uh, Morgan is our uh, our uh, guest speaker with us today, and uh, we're lucky to have her here. Kara's been an anti-racism educator and facilitator for over thirty years, and and has delivered uh, anti-racism workshops and webinars to adults and children, police departments, private organizations, online and in person. Um, she's reviewed and revised policies for both the public and separate boards in Alberta, Ontario using that anti-racism lens and has been a facilitator for the government of Alberta's cultural ambassador program. Um, through her advocacy work in the, uh, the black and the broader community care is uh, trying to promote a unified understanding and common terminology. that's going to help erase much of the confusion and misinformation currently prevalent in the media and popular culture, which presents us from seeing the bigger issues around anti-black systemic racism uh, Kara is the owner of Planet Efficiency Solutions, the mother of two sons who are a constant reminder of why this work is so important. So Kara, thank you uh, for your patience in, uh, in coming online with us and, uh, and welcome in a virtual way to Milton. Thank you very much. And I must apologize that nothing, Zoom still won't open. I have no idea. Um, thank you all for, for being here. Thank you for um, being patient with me and um, appreciate both the MP and the MPP. Um, as you say, tap dancing while uh, I was waiting for this to come on. And thank you so much, Alyssa, for your patience. Um, so when you're ready, um, just let me know and I'll, I'll start um, my slide on my end. And perhaps yeah, we're all set to go. We, uh, we see the title slide now. Okay, that's great. So I'll just say next slide when I'm ready. So um, as you all know, we're here to have a conversation on anti-Black racism in Canada. And this is part one. So I'll be going through um, my portion of it. Uh, next slide. Um, so we're on slide two now. Yes, we are, yes. Uh, 
Okay, great. So the purpose of this learning exercise is to define anti-Black systemic racism, what it is and what it's not, learn why it's a, it's a foundation for all forms of racism. We'll take a holistic look at racism in Canada, and we'll try to differentiate anti-Black racism in Canada versus what it looks like in the U.S. Uh, we'll see anti-Black systemic racism at play in society and the workplace. We'll try to understand the impact of anti-Black racism on the Black on Black people as well as non-Black people. And then finally, I'll just give you some five steps that you can take in your organization um, to address um, anti-Black systemic racism. Next slide. So your next slide just say ground rules. Yes. Okay, so I will be using the term black to describe people of African heritage and white to describe people of European heritage. I'll look at racism from the perspective of sustainability, asserting that it is not sustainable, that it creates an imbalance and produces division. I'll also clarify some of the misunderstood definitions, as well as explain why there's such, a mis such misinformation about anti-black systemic racism. And I want to acknowledge that this may be uncomfortable for some, but the purpose of this exercise is not to shame anyone or to pity anyone. We're here to learn and to raise awareness. Next slide. So um, there's some information on myself. Um, so you should have three pictures. Uh, one is uh, me, um, my two sons, uh, and the, the place where I'm from, which is St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So I'm a certified project manager and the founder of Planet Efficiency Solutions, as, as Scott mentioned. I'm from St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but I grew up in Alberta and Ontario came here at a young age, and I've been doing this work for 30 years, as Scott said, um, and he also mentioned the areas where I do the work. Uh, next slide. So what we do is help, as a planet, we help um, growth-minded professional service providers and startups um, build efficient, sustainable businesses using digital automation. Um, we also do this work as part of our social enterprise. Um, with our social enterprise, we're trying to provide avenues to create financial stability and independence, um, primarily for marginalized women and children. Next slide. So how did we get here? Racism is not, next slide, sorry. Racism in Canada. So racism has existed here for hundreds of years. It's nothing new, um, but it came to the forefront with the recent murder uh, and uh, public display of that murder of George Floyd in, the, in America. Racism itself is profitable, and that is why it keep, it's perpetual. It keeps on going because a lot of money can be made from um, racist propaganda. So currently what we see is some Band-Aid solutions and water down depiction of what black people experience on a day-to-day -day basis in society. Um, more so in Canada, um, that concept is watered down. We also have media influence in Hollywood stereotypes that reinforce our racist beliefs and popular culture and language reinforce that racism as well. Next slide. So in Canada, uh, we, it was commonly known when I was growing up in Alberta that there was a KKK headquarters located in uh, south of Calgary in uh, Caroline, Alberta. Um, Halton itself has a long history of KKK presence. Uh, many of the schools and landmarks are named after slave owners in Halton. And as well, some of the city officials would condone activities like cross burnings and things like that um, that were... Um, done by the KKK. On another note, uh, Halton was also, particularly Oakville, um, were, was also a destination for escaped slaves coming through the Underground Railroad. Um, there are some historic buildings and uh, stuff there in, in just along Lakeshore and Oakville that are designated as um, homes where some of these um, former slaves uh, would take refuge. Next slide. 
So one of the most misunderstood um, definitions is the definition of race. And race is itself an identity that is created. So this is manufactured um, often by socially, socially dominant groups to establish meaning in a social context. This often involves the subjugation of groups defined as racially inferior to exclude those with any amount of African ancestry from the dominant racial grouping uh, defined as white. Race is not, a bio, is not biologically defined. So there is no um, bio, biology or um, evolutionary uh, connection to race. It's something that was manufactured by the people that created um, this system that we'll talk about in a minute. Next slide. So that brings us to the term white supremacy. And what's important to understand about this definition is that it's not um, what you hear in the media about right, white supremacist, which is um, more of the, the group that you would see or something that you would use to identify um, individuals. This definition is more about um, an ideology and a belief system. So it's not about the individual, but about the belief system around this, um, this ideology. So it's the belief that white people are superior to other races and should be dominant over them. However, it is also uh, has day-to-day -day application in reference to systemic racism and unconscious bias. And I'll get into what unconscious bias is later on in the presentation. It is embedded directly in society and results in white privilege. And that's also, um, some of you may have heard that term often, so um, also uh, get into that a little bit. Next slide. So um, another misunderstood definition is racism. So racism is a mix of prejudice and power. And that power component is really the key. Um, it's leading to domination and exploitation of one group, the dominant group, over another group, the non-dominant group. It asserts that the one group is supreme and superior while the other is inferior. Racism is any individual action or institutional practice backed by institutional power, which subordinates people because of their color or ethnicity. So without the power component, all you really have is a prejudice, and that could be anything. Um, it doesn't have to be race. It could be anything. It could be prejudiced against somebody for, you know, what they wear or how they do a certain thing. It's just a dislike for somebody because they don't do something like you do. Next slide. So understanding racism in Canada and the US. Next slide. So um, if we look at the two populations, um, Canada, the black population in Canada is about 3.5%, whereas in the US it's 13.5%. Um, that comes into play as far as the tactics go and why it's not so prevalent in Canada. I'll explain that in a minute. 54% of the Black people in Canada are here um, as first-generation um, people. This has changed over the last 20 years. Um, we're seeing more recent um, immigration from the African um, countries. In Nova Scotia you, or in the Atlantic provinces, you would have um, three to four generations of, of um, Black communities that were, would have come up from the States through the Underground Railroad. In the United States, black um, communities go back um, as far as nine generations or more. Many of the um, black uh, people in Canada are primarily from the Caribbean or from Africa, whereas in the States, you also have those two groups, but also many from South America and the majority of the black people there will, would consider America their home because they've been there for many generations. In Canada, you have what is called covert forms of racism, which are hidden forms of racism um, that are not as visible as the overt form that, forms that you would see in the U.S. So in the U.S., you would have, um, you know, like protests and, uh, you know, beatings and um, people telling you that you're not getting an apartment because of your color, things like that. In Canada, it's not that blatant. It's more an undercurrent and it's more policy-based and institution-based. So in Canada, it's pretty much the people that are experiencing the racism that are aware of it. 
everyone else who's part of the larger society or most of the people would not be aware of it because it doesn't happen directly to them. It happens through policies and things that happen behind closed doors, decisions that are made um, behind closed doors. In Canada, we also have employment equity, which is different from affirmative action, which is what you have in the States. And this is referring to um, human resources practices um, and um, in different institutions. So in the States, you would have um, in, say, an educational institution where they have to admit a certain amount of Black people based on a quota system. So it's a number. And once they reach that quota, then they don't have to admit anymore or they don't have to hire anymore. And it's not necessarily based on merit or skill. It's based on a quota and a number system. Whereas in Canada, um, they, what, they have what is called employment equity, which is based more on merit and qualifications and tries to create, create an equitable um, climate as opposed to a, a quota based climate, if that's understandable. Next slide. So how does racism hide in society? So I gave you a few examples just a minute ago. Next slide. Um, Anti-black systemic racism, I'll just start off with the definition, is policies and practices rooted in Canadian institutions such as education, healthcare, the justice system, et cetera and mirrors and reinforces the, these beliefs um, of white supremacy, attitudes, prejudice, stereotyping, and or discrimination towards people of African descent. Next slide. So racism works as a system. Next slide. And I'll just um, show you how that works in society. So for what I do, we try to provide a holistic operating system to people to um, help them to be more productive and efficient. So for that to happen, you need to have the right equipment, the right people around you, the right programs and apps and what have you. So if we take away one of those components, let's say um, we take away your printer, your business is still running, but it's not running as well. But all of those things are interconnected. So we also see um, systems in other parts of society. Uh, next slide. For instance, in the body, we have um, various systems that keep your body running and without them, your body would either, either stop running or be impaired in some way. So we've got your digestive system, your nervous system, the reproductive system, et cetera. So let's say for instance, that your digestive system, um, at, in order to get your digestive system to work, you intake food, the saliva in your mouth breaks that down. It goes into your stomach. Your stomach breaks it down a little bit more. And what your body doesn't use or need, it turns into waste and it leaves your body. So let's say something happens to your stomach and you're not able to digest that food properly. That would impact your digestion um, and also your body, but it doesn't stop you from functioning. Everything still functions as a system and as a whole. So removing one component would impair it a little bit, but it doesn't stop the system from um, working. Next slide. So anti-Black racism itself is a system um, and it's based primarily throughout the institutions and society. So we have the justice system, the health system, education, et cetera. And those systems all work together to perpetuate anti-Black racism and other forms of racism. So if um, we hear a lot of talk about defunding the police or, you know, um, reforming uh, social systems, the, the problem with that or the challenge with that is even if you defund the police, the justice system is composed not only of police, but you've also got the uh, lawyers, um, which there, uh, there's an underrepresentation of, of, of black people in that profession. You've also got the, um, the court system. You've also got um, other, other components that make up um, that whole justice system. So even if you take the police out of the equation, there's still those other components that are keeping it going. And you add on top of that um, discriminatory or anti-racist anti practices in, in the healthcare in getting housing, in the banking system, getting a loan, for instance. Um, the education uh, system is also a huge problem. So 
so it's uh, it would need something like institutional reform and not just pulling out these individual pieces out of the system um, and, and thinking that might make it work. Um, next slide. So all of these puzzle pieces fit together. So when um, people uh, make suggestions about, um, let's say, having a multicultural day or having, um, you know, um, like a potluck, a multicultural potluck, those are band-aid solutions that really don't address the core problem of the institutionalized um, nature of, of um, racism. It's embedded in our justice system. It's in the laws, and those laws have been around for hundreds of years. Um, and as I mentioned, the rule of power is an intricate part of the system because without the power of having the, the ability to, to change the laws and to you know, create policies and institutions and um, banking institutions, um, it's just a prejudice, not just, but it, it's a prejudice. So that power component is key because people are in positions to make those de decisions. And this goes back, um, it's, this is above government, it's uh, above countries or, or nations and you know what uh, the laws and um, norms that are set in those countries. This would go back hundreds of years to Europe where the system was developed based on um, imperialism, based on um, colonialism and the mindset at that time and a very small group of primarily white men would be in the deciding, in the decision, making the decisions and those laws and um, patterns still perpetuate to this day. So uh, when we speak about multiculturalism or diversity, it's uh, in uh, kind of an elusive way, it's a watered down version of um, what's really happening. It doesn't get to the core of the issue and it kind of muddies the water when you compare it um, because multi multiculturalism and diversity doesn't take into consideration the power component. Um, I also want to be clear that the system, uh, I feel it's deliberate because what it's trying to do is exploit the differences between people. So um, that, that um, primary difference being um, white versus black, but it goes deeper than that. Um, so you would have, um, you know, rich versus poor, men versus women, you know, um, in this uh, current situation, who's wearing a mask, who's not wearing a mask. So the whole system, while it starts off as, as um, some racist platform, it impacts everything we do in society because it's trying to create division and, um, and combat and um, just unrest. And the point is for people not to, to get together and speak and unify because we could solve so many problems if we were able to work together and um, overlook those differences that are manufactured, for lack of a better word. Um, next slide. So this is how we would break the cycle. Once we understand that there are differences and that they're manufactured, and they're really um, getting at the emotional side um, of people, it's, it's designed to create emotions um, and to get you to, uh, to the pit of your core about things that are very dear to you and valuable to you. And if you feel at any time that those things are going to be taken away or threatened by somebody who looks different than you, then you're going to have your back up all of the time when you see that person or that situation. Next slide. So in the workplace, what it would look like is an underrepresentation in the management or executive positions. So if 10% um, of your um, population is um, black people, for example, or people of color, the, the theory is that th that should be reflected in your workforce and in your management. Um, not receiving credit for work that was given or giving the credit to someone else. That's very common. And yes, there are certain um, jobs where, um, you know, the, uh, let's say the senior executive would present the information, but that doesn't stop you from saying, well, this person worked on this information or our research was com compiled by such and such. 
And a lot of time that second part doesn't happen. So that person would present the information and not mention that there was somebody else in the background pulling this all together. Um, feeling the need to prove your abilities or qualifications is another thing that um, not just black people, but people of color in general experience. Also being asked to change your appearance. Um, unfortunately, you can't see me, but I have um, I, what you would call dreads in my hair or I call them twists, but to you, they might look like dreads. Um, 25 years ago or so, even 10, five years ago, this was called an unprofessional look. It was not acceptable, and many people had to either cut their dreads off or change their hairstyle in place of something that looked more European. So a straight hair, um, natural hair was not acceptable and still is in, in many organizations. Certain ways of dressing isn't acceptable. Now, that's a human rights issue um, in most cases, um, but there's still ways to get around that with your dress code, and that needs to be looked at. Underemployment and transient employment is a, a problem with um, the Black community. Um, again, and, and this has nothing to do with the education level. In fact, um, Black people on the whole have a higher level of post-secondary education um, compared to the overall population. This has more to do um, probably, I shouldn't say probably, but primarily with the connections that are made and how they're made. So you might uh, socialize with people that look like you, that do the same things that you do. And if you're not, if you're a black person or a person of color in that same situation, you might not get, say, invited, or you might not be part of that situation, that socializing, or those networks or, you know, those clubs that people belong to. So you would not be a first uh, choice, let's say, when there's a job offer or a vacancy might come up. Um, so that's how it works. It's not, again, it's not deliberate um, most times. It's not um, something that's in your face. It just kind of happens because of how people move and the relationships that people um, have with each other. And that's part of that covert form of racism. Um, not accepting or acknowledging foreign credentials is a big problem for people that come from other countries. And again, the theory is that um, they have a lesser uh, form of education or um, it's not as robust or um, as advanced as North American. Whereas if you were to switch the table, um, uh, and a North American person was to go to one of these other nations, that's not the case. They're usually put in a higher position, get paid more, um, the same, if not more, than the local population, and they get a lot of other perks as well. Um, here, there are people that have PhDs that are, you know, um, cleaning buildings, that are doing, um, you know, retail work because their credentials aren't accepted, and it's... Uh, it's odd because if you go to other countries, they're typically people that speak more than one language, unlike North Americans are typically only one, uh, one language um, countries. Um, whereas if you go overseas, uh, people speak at least two in most cases, um, with the exception of, of Quebec. I don't want to leave that out. Um, so the other thing is being subjugated, subjected to microaggressions. And these are really uh, like forms of um, um, uh, what you might call it, passive aggressive behavior that seem innocent, but it's those little jabs that you make at people when they accomplish something and you degrade it or you, you minimize it to make it seem like, you know, well, there's a reason that happened and it wasn't because of your skill or what have you. And they take those jabs at you. And the last thing is that BIPOC people are, are subjected to more scrutiny when making the same requests as white people. So, for instance, if um, uh, BIPOC is Black, Indigenous, um, and people of color, um, so if they wanted to take a, a day off, for instance, um, that would be scrutinized more heavily than, say, if a white employee wanted to take um, a day off, you know, for whatever reason. Next slide. So here are some things, here are five things that you can do to address it. And, and just let me know if my timing is still okay. Um, yeah, we've got five more minutes. So test the water, see if there are any signs, signs that changes need to be made. 
Um, is it impacting team dynamics, for instance, or morale? Um, are there visible or tangible inequities despite the same qualifications and skills? And this would be in your, your workforce. Sorry, next slide. I'm on number two now. So create a safe space uh, for people to have these dialogues. So start a mentorship program. Um, have Q&A forums, and this would be like in a digital format. So uh, in digital formats, we can uh, say online, we can have forums that are anonymous. But if you're in a small team where it would be obvious who's asking that question, then anonymous is not the way to go. You would look for another another way to address those concerns that doesn't expose um, the person that's asking them. Also, you can create review policies. That's a, a big one because those are um, perpetual um, in most cases. Um, and acknowledge lived and daily experiences of, of um, Black and Indigenous um, people of color. Um, because we have different experiences, you make if you're driving a nice car, for instance, and you're a black person, this is um, more so um, in the past um, is more common, but you might get stopped on your way to work because um, they don't think you should be driving that car. Or you might live in a neighborhood where people are asking you, you know, how did you afford your house? Um, and that might delay you getting to work or it might change your demeanor when you get to work because you're, you know, having to address some of these things that wouldn't be asked to somebody if they weren't um, black or, you know, a person of color. Next slide. I'm on uh, number three now. So evaluate your HR practices and make sure that there's fair representation and that the rules are clear. Um, use pay, pay based on performance instead of um, some other arbitrary um, fac factors. Um, track the success of employees who start at the same level. So if you've got um, a, a black employee and a non-black employee or a white employee in this case, and they're starting off at the same level with the same background, same qualifications, same experience, um, track that and see if one person is moving up faster than the other for whatever reasons, and then investigate the reasons behind that. Um, next slide. So break old patterns. So one of the problems that I mentioned before was that there's uh, people of color and black people in particular are, are underpaid. So where's the national average for, let's say, women um, make 80% of what a white man would make? Um, for the case of black people, it's something like between 70 and 75%, a little bit lower for black men or black women, sorry. Um, so check those social networks and groups. So again, who is in your um, groupings? Who's, who are you hanging out with and who's getting those job offers? Um, redefine the notion of fit. So this comes up a lot in, um, in workplaces where, you know, somebody might consider it not to be a good fit. So really examine that and really ask yourself, what do you mean by fit? Is it the way they look? Is it, you know, something about their personality or is it something that's legitimately based like skill or education or, um, you know, their background, their, meaning their work background? Really examine that, that term because it's a sticky one. Um, and, and lastly, don't leave the, the onus, don't put the onus on black people to change. This is not an Afrocentric uh, society that we live in. And this is global. This is not um, specific to Canada or the US. Um, anywhere you go in the world, the system kind of operates this way. It looks different based on the people in the population. Um, but it's pretty much the same thing. If you're white, you um, get more privilege, more access, um, um, more, uh, um, uh, ex not excuses, but, you know, you're let off from certain things. Um, whereas the closer you are to black, the harder it is for you to have access and um, to get privileged, sometimes not at all, right? Um, next slide. And uh, lastly, uh, work on yourself. So acknowledge that there is white privilege and white power and the power that you have with that privilege, rather not white power, but the power that you have um, being a white person. Understand that there are conscious 
unconscious biases that take place. So again, you know, um, who am I socializing with? Why am I offering this person a job and not um, this other person? Those are things that are unconscious, but they happen because of the circles that we move in. And be aware of historical and generational con- conditions that have created anti-Black systemic racism. Um, this has been going on, like I said, for hundreds of, of years. And because Black people were enslaved, that has created 400 years of depletion and of debt. And if you want to look at it from the perspective of wealth, because there were slaves and because people owned other people and because there was exploitation of the land and exploitation of the resources, people um, from European nations um, profited from that. And that profit has benefited their, their, um, their offspring. And the same in convert in converts, um, same with slavery, because people were denied wealth, were denied access, were denied um, land ownership, that has had an impact over uh, hundreds of years. And so now the scale is really unbalanced and there is a disproportionate um, um, there's disproportionality um, that's existing today. So what makes that unsustainable is that any in anywhere in the world or anywhere in our society, if you have an unbalance, it, an imbalance, it, it cannot perpetuate, it cannot survive because the scale is tipped. So you can't have rain all the time or sun all of the time. It ha- there has to be a balance. And that's what's important about anti-Black racism, um, that division, creating that division and that friction constantly through the media, through um, social um, structures um, through Hollywood depiction of black people in these unrealistic um, scenarios that creates an imbalance. But if that's all you know about black people is what you've seen on TV, then you would think of them in a certain way. And then that creates friction and conflict instead of everyone trying to work together to, you know, make the environment better and create a better future for our children and create, you know, um, people that have housing and and food, everyone um, being able to live uh, a decent life. So um, that imbalance needs to be eradicated. Next slide. And I think that's the last slide. So I just want to thank you all for your patience. And it's 1033 right now. Um, I did want to answer some questions. Um, uh, Next slide. My contact information is there. Next slide. And my social media. Next slide. And my question um, slide is there. So I'm not sure if um, people are have somewhere to go or if there's still time, but I'm available. And if not, um, you can certainly um, send them to Alyssa or Scott, and I'd be happy to answer them. That's great. Thanks, Kara. We, uh, we do have a question earlier in your presentation. You talked about uh, some of the schools and landmarks in Halton being named after slave owners. And there was a question about mm-hmm. where people could find information about that. Um, so a number of places. So the, um, the CCAH, the Canadian Caribbean Association of Halton, um, has information on that. They would have some links. Um, there's also... Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Um, if you Google, um, um, what is it called? Um, Black Associations in Ontario, it would give you a list of, of the exact names of them. And it's escaping me right now because I'm a little bit stressed <laughs> because <laughs> of the presentation. Okay, you can send but the information to us and we can share it with people. Okay, sure. Well, I wanted to thank you, Kara, for the presentation. We've uh, we've had a lot of uh, very positive comments coming through on the uh, on the the chat area, um, and and I agree, it's been a, a great discussion to have. Um, as you said at the beginning, I mean, it's, it can be a difficult discussion, but it's uh, very very necessary. And uh, and you've not only given us kind of the background information, but also given us the the five point plan for for taking those action steps to to make a difference. So that uh, that's very much appreciated. Uh, Adam uh, is still on the line with us. Uh, 
since I, I put him on the spot at the beginning, I, I figure it's only fair to put him on the spot at the end. And uh, he's plugging his uh, his uh, headphone back in. <laughs> but Adam, I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you wanted to have some closing comments before I thank you. Uh, thank Kara. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Kara. I would really, really like to thank Kara for that incredibly insightful webinar. Thank you. I learn uh, something new every time. Um, I, I uh, am lucky enough to be engaged with an expert of your caliber. So thank you very much for joining us and providing us with the perspective and insight from, from your work and research. Um, I have to apologize. Earlier when I was sending links, I wasn't sending them to all panelists and attendees. So uh, I've, I've tried to rectify that. The, the link that I was referencing earlier with respect to the, the Black Entrepreneurship Fund and the Building Back Better strategy and the Federal Anti-Racism Secretariat, all of that is, is on the website and I didn't send it properly initially, so my apologies. Uh, Kara, thank you so much. Your insight, your perspective and your research, uh, your presentation was perfect. Um, I learned a lot and I'm sure a lot of people did. Um, please be in touch with my office if you've got any questions, suggestions, guidance, recommendations. Um, we pride ourselves at my office in being um, champions for diversity and inclusion and anti-racism. So um, that also includes having an open mind and always being open to criticism, suggestions, recommendations, and yours are well taken today. Um, you'll notice I did a wardrobe change while my camera was off. I have to run to question period. I'm covering for two ministers today. Uh, so hopefully uh, the opposition are kind because uh, instead of preparing for a question period, I was spending my time with you, which is a far better use of, of my time and for everybody else. So Kara, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, thank you on behalf of everybody that doesn't have a microphone today. Um, I wish we could meet in person. It's th this imbalance, frankly, isn't fair. It's the, the necessity of the technology. But um, if we were in a, in a room learning from each other, I think that would be far more better. So next time we'll put up our hands and we'll have a, vi a vibrant back and forth conversation. Uh, thank you, everybody. I have to bail. Kara, okay, it was really nice to see you today. Thank you, Scott, for convening this very important webinar. Well, Bye, thanks everyone. Thanks for being with us. And Thank Kara you. Adams said it perfectly. Uh, we uh, we really appreciate uh, your uh, your being with us today. Uh, you had some technical challenges, but uh, you you motored through, and it was an excellent presentation. So, so on behalf of everyone that attended, uh, thank you very much. Thank you uh, as well. And yes, I, I'm not able to see the word rope change. <laughs> um, but as I said, if there are any questions, um, feel free to email me or um, send them to. The, um, the chamber and I'd be more than happy to answer them. And just a reminder to everyone, Kara mentioned this at the beginning, but um, we are doing this as a, as a two-part series. So today we focused in on, on uh, anti-black racism uh, in the new year. We haven't set the date yet, but in the new year, we'll be coming back with part two, talking about uh, our uh, Southeast Asian community. So uh, watch your chamber emails for that. And uh, with that, again, thank you, Kara, and thank you for, for, to everyone for attending. And uh, that's the end of our program for today. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you.